I invite you to take your Bibles today and turn to Jeremiah chapter 33. We'll be reading verse 14 through 16. Jeremiah 33, 14 through 16. I'll be preaching today on the subject because of Christmas. Jeremiah 33, 14. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem, Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture and the things that it promises the nation of Israel and how we can draw also from those promises for ourselves as we come to the Christmas season. I pray you'll bless the message. Those that are listening today, we pray that you'll strengthen them. Those that are sick, you'll help them in their affliction. Those, Lord, that uh, are have, have to be away for other reasons, we pray you'll help them as they travel and bring them back safely. Use us this day to honor and glorify Jesus Christ. It's in his name for his purpose, we pray. Amen. One of my favorite authors is a man named Stephen Ambrose. He's a prolific history writer. He's written many great history books. Among my favorites are books about John Adams, and he also wrote one about the Wright brothers. He wrote one about Truman, President Truman, all really good books. He, uh, he's a talented writer. And one time in one of his forwards, in one of his introductions, he said this, people don't hate history. They hate the way that it's been taught to them. Now, whether or not you agree with that or disagree with that, <clears throat> it makes sense to me. Of course, I'm a history learner and a history teacher. I've taught history, U.S. history, and other history courses through my life. And of course, the Bible has much to do with history, and we'll be talking about some of that history today. But we've all had them. We've all hated them. We've all had those teachers that we can't wait for the bell to ring. We can't wait for the class to end. We can't wait for the lecture to be over because it just seems like that they expect us to learn a few dates regurgitate some facts, and if we can do that, we'll do well, but we really don't feel like we've learned anything. But then you get that history teacher that is someone special, someone who can take something of the past and tie it into what's taking place today and tie the ribbon together, and it makes sense. I mean, the past becomes vitally important as a result of the way that they teach. The past is important because it becomes a marker to help us understand what's happened in the past. The past is important because it teaches us some valuable lessons that hopefully we learn and we don't repeat the same mistakes of the past. And history is important because it teaches something about the nature of human life and the life of human beings. Now, I realize it's easier said than done because the more we study the past, the more we seem to be people who take one step forward and two steps back. And in spite of our desire not to repeat the same mistakes, to not go down the same path that others have gone or even ourselves have gone, we nevertheless find ourselves discovering that those cliches that we throw out seem to ring true. Uh, one cliche is the more things change, the more they stay the same. One of my favorites is the only thing that men learn from history is they never learn anything from history. So despite our determination to do things differently, we're going to turn over a new leaf, despite our commitment, despite our wherewithal, despite our stilly will, it seems next to impossible to ever overcome the sins of the past. It seems to always be part of us. I heard about a pastor who was doing a marriage ceremony once. And during the marriage ceremony, he said to the couple, by the grace of God, 
may you grow old together. That might be the understatement of the year. Because it is by the grace of God that two people are able to stay together. Given the emotional baggage, the psychological baggage, the, the um, sins that people commit against one another, the grudges that they hold against one another, the grievances, real, sometimes imagined, that they bring up against each other. It's indeed the, great, the grace of God that people can overcome their past and move toward the future in a relationship together. Another way our past affects us is, is even in our own health. Uh, as I get age and get older, I understand the consequences of my past decisions. It seems the uh, shortness of breath, the pain in the chest, the stiffness in the joints, all remind us we reap what we sow. And we can't escape the consequences of past choices, of past decisions. Just give me one more dessert. Um, let me eat this fast food just one more time. The lack of exercise or the lack of regular intervals of eight hours of sleep eventually are going to catch up with you and it limits your choice for future actions. So we are prisoners of history. We are doomed because of choices we made in the past and we're finally going to die. The sentence has already been passed. We've already been to the judgment bar. The trial has already been held. We are being held on death row and it's just a matter of us waiting the day of our execution. Now, you may say, man, what a pessimistic view to have. And I can balance it. I can say, as the scripture promises us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that when the Lord returns, we call it the rapture of the church, when the Lord returns, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. As 1 Corinthians 15 says, we'll say, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And we'll fly upward and meet the Lord. Now, barring that event, it isn't pessimistic to say to someone, you're going to die, because it's what the Bible tells us, and it's not only what the Bible tells us, it's what history proves to us. Because only two people in history have ever lived that never died. Enoch in the book of Genesis, Elijah in the book of Kings. Besides that, death is batting a thousand. Now we come to Jeremiah chapter 33, and it addresses a situation, the context of what's taking place here. It's about 600 years before the birth of Jesus Christ, and Israel is stuck in the consequences of of the sins of their past. And it is shipwrecking and destroying their future. The mistakes of the past are so real that it's caught up with them. And God has warned them over and over and over again that if you continue on the path that you're going, you're going to face the consequences. But Israel did not listen. Judah did not listen. They had kings that were sprinkled in that were good kings like Asa and Josiah and Hezekiah and Jehoshaphat, but for the most part, particularly in the nation of Israel, the ten northern tribes, it was wickedness. They set up high places, they worshiped, they worshiped false gods, they sacrificed to golden calves like were taught by Jeroboam and Rehoboam, and they did not return to the Lord their God and follow after the Lord as David did. And therefore God says, if you don't follow after David, if you don't have a heart like David, if you don't follow me and obey me as David did, then you're going to face the consequences. And certainly they did. In 586 B.C., about 600 years before Christ, about the time this book here in Jeremiah 33 has been written, the Babylonians come in and they sweep Israel away because of the sins of their past. Because of choices they've made in the past, they're now paying for in the future. And they came in and destroyed Jerusalem. The Babylonians came in and destroyed that magnificent temple that Solomon had built. They had kings humiliated. 
For example, they took Jehoiakim and removed him. They took his 18-year-old son, Jehoiachin, and sent him into exile. They set up a king named Mattanai, who was actually the uncle of the last king. And they dubbed him, the Babylonians did, dubbed him and called him Zedekiah. Now that's very important because of the passage we read. Let me tell you what Zedekiah means. Here's a history lesson for you. Zedekiah means the Lord our righteous. Now that isn't something that they did in order to glorify God and honor God. In fact, what they're doing is they're adding insult to injury. That's a term of derision that the Babylonians had for him. They obviously had no respect for God, no respect for God's word, as they come in and sweep Israel away. And so these foreigners are actually making fun of God. One more humiliation they did. In 2 Kings chapter 25, it says that the Babylonians murdered Zedekiah's sons before his eyes and then put his eyes out. They didn't take him then and execute him. They placed him in prison. They placed him under guard. And he had to suffer for the rest of his life, having the last memory that he ever saw was his sons being executed before his very eyes. They absolutely had no respect for this puny upstart nation called Israel. They thought their king was incompetent and they thought their God was impotent. So all the symbols are destroyed. I want you to understand that. The city of Jerusalem is in rubble. The Solomon Temple is destroyed. They've had to give up their land. They've given up the holy city. They've given up the temple. And now they've given up their king. And they're loving and merciful and forgiving God who's worthy to be praised. They are left with nothing but rubble and deportation of their young men to a strange land who worship and serve false and foreign gods. And Israel is facing the biggest crisis of their history. What were the questions that came to their mind? Well, they thought their faith was in vain. Questions entered their mind like, what about our God? Was he really weak as the Babylonians say? Could he not defend himself? Is he really insignificant? Has he been defeated? Does he even exist? We don't have a land, we don't have a city, we don't have a temple, we don't have a king, we have no hope, we have no future, and we have no faith. Now, that's where our text comes in. Because Jeremiah steps forth out of that rubble, out of that destruction, and he plants his feet firmly on the ground and refuses to accept the evidence of the moment. Contrary to all appearances, contrary of all the evidence to the contrary, Jeremiah insists that God has not abandoned his people. Instead, God promised them a new future. They do not have to be prisoners of their past. There's a day coming when God will show them signs that he is faithful, that he is true, that their status as God's chosen people will be restored. They will have the land again. They will have their city again. They will have their temple again. And they will have a king after David's own heart. That's what Jeremiah 33 says. Verse 14. See our text again. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will perform that good thing which I have promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days, at that time, will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he will execute judgment and righteousness in the land. That's the promise they had when they went into the Babylonian captivity. For 70 years, they clung to that promise. Later on, we discover Daniel in Babylon reads Jeremiah and believes the promises of God and believes that God will send them back. He didn't give up. 
and they didn't give up. They waited for their king, the righteous branch, the true descendant of the king David, who would restore their good fortunes and lead them into the future righteousness. Now what does all that have to do with us? Well, here's what I have to say. At this time of year, we're anticipating the coming of Christmas. It's a time that we celebrate the fact that Jesus Christ came to Bethlehem, was born of a virgin, was raised before men, began his ministry, and showed that he was the fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy. Jesus Christ was the true Zedekiah. Jesus Christ was the true, the Lord, our righteousness. That God was going to keep his promises and fulfill his promises in this man we know as Jesus Christ. But, of course, things didn't go well. They went as God planned. They didn't go as we expected. It certainly didn't go the way the Jews expected. Because their leaders, their scribes, their Pharisees, their lawyers, their doctors of the law, all rejected him. And they become imposters. They become fakes. They're interested in their own careers. They're only interested in their own position. They don't want to give it up. And sometimes we find ourselves in the same situation. We have these great promises that God gives us in the Bible, but sometimes we're slapped with reality. The boss that we thought we could trust, the friend we thought we could count on, the spouse we thought we could believe in, the job we thought was safe and secure, all too often turn out to be disappointments, pretenders, betrayers of faith, saboteurs of our hopes. And even worse, we're unable to shake the ghosts of the past that haunt us the pauper is finally going to have to be paid. Jerusalem and the temple and the monarchy obliterated. And we struggle with that because we see what's going on in our country and we wonder, where is our God? We seem to be a culture that's gagging on its own self-indulgence. The disease of affluence is destroying us. Our extravagance is consuming us. Our complacency is choking us. And God's beginning to hold our feet to the fire as a nation. And just as He made Israel pay for her sins, He will make us pay for our sins as well. In fact, the pain and the disappointment we suffer every day are signs that already the reaping for our past has begun. But then we have Christmas. Then we have Christmas. Christmas is not only a time to look at the past and rejoice in the fact that joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. It's also a time to ponder our future. And that is just as surely as Jesus Christ came the first time, he will come the second time. He said, I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That means we not only ponder the blessed fact of the babe of Bethlehem, Emmanuel, God with us, born at Christmas time, but also the second coming of Christ, when the Lord will judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. We have to remember that the righteous branch, the Lord our righteousness, Jesus Christ, is our only hope. And what did he do? As the Son of God, he suffered our fate under the Father's wrath. His death stopped the charges against us, the accusations made against us. God so loved the world that he chose not to make the world pay for its sins, but rather for his Son to pay the sins of the whole world. So he suffered our judgment. He suffered our condemnation. He suffered our death. He took our death sentence upon himself that we might be ransomed, that we might be redeemed, that we might be set free from a damnable fate 
and the sins of our past. A mother was walking down the street one day with her young child. And they were having a, a, a merry time on a beautiful day. And as they enjoyed the stroll, suddenly a dog barked and it distracted the mother and she let loose a bit from the hand of her child and distracted as she relaxes that grip, he slips away as a child would and runs into the street. So the mother turns and gets her awareness back. She realizes what's happening. She screams at the child as she sees a truck coming down the street in a fast path. The truck driver is oblivious to the fact that there's a child in front of him. Death is certain. So the mother runs out into the street shouting for the child to run, to run, to run. And when she lunges, she pushes the child out of the path of the truck only to be crushed and killed herself. It's an ultimate act of love and that she sacrificed her life for the life of her child. Now that's just an illustration. But an illustration of what God has done for us. Because of the first coming of Jesus Christ, our Zedekiah, our true Zedekiah, the authentic, the Lord our righteousness, we can look forward to the second coming of Christ because of the first coming of Christ. And we will see him. And he will come and straighten out this crooked world and make the, the crooked ways straight. It's a future that's filled with hope and promise. Our past need not enslave us. We're no longer imprisoned by it. We can live differently, not chained to our past because of what Jesus Christ has done. Because of the first Christmas, we have a, a sure hope. We have a new future. You have a life filled with possibilities and you can go out and do the things that you never thought possible. So this year, because of Christmas, give God a new thanks that you're no longer shackled to your past. You're pardoned and you're set free. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God and thank you for this promise. Thank you for the lessons from history. Thank you that you came to earth the first time 2,000 years ago and we pray it's only a matter of days or hours that you come the second time. Help us to be ready. Help us to be willing. Help us to be watchful. Help us to be praying. Help us to be living in a way that's pure and righteous that we might have that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Bless those at this Christmas season, Lord, who have suffered heartache and tragedy because of the death of loved ones, because of bad doctors' announcements that have been given to them concerning their health and their future. I pray, God, you'll wrap your arms around those people, particularly at this time of year, and show them your great love wherewith you have loved them, we pray these things in Christ's name for his sake. Amen.